I've been talking every day for 30 years. I mean days. Alhamdulillah, you guys survived somehow. Must have been some of the best sleep you've had your whole life. That's good. Those chairs really help some people. It's just... <laughs> Your iman goes so high, your ruh travels, you know, like, <laughs> it's great. Let's get a couple of minutes, inshallah. Oh, no. Sure. What's the date two Sundays from now, do you know? July the 24th. What's the one after that? 24th? 24th. 24th. Yep. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Wa laqad atayna Musa al-kitab wa qaffaynahu min ba'dihi bil rusul. Wa atayna Isa ibn Maryam al-bayyinat wa ayyadnahu bi ruhi al-qudus. أَفَكُلَّمَا جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ بِمَا لَا تَهْوَى أَنفُسُكُمُ اسْتَكْبَرْتُمْ فَفَرِيقًا كَذَّبْتُمْ وَفَرِيقًا تَقْتُلُونَ وَقَالُوا قُلُوبُنَا غُلْفٌ بَلْ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِكُفْرِهِمْ فَقَلِيلًا مَا يُؤْمِنُونَ وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ كِتَابٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَهُمْ وَكَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ يَسْتَفْتِحُونَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِهِ فَلَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته that's a press this button here there we are okay so inshallah ta'ala today is our final session some of you may be sad about that i think that's very strange uh, you should be relieved Alhamdulillah, we survived 30 consecutive sessions. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept your sitting in the durus and hearing something about the Qur'an. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept it from me, trying to teach something about the Qur'an and study it. And may Allah overlook the mistakes we've all made. Um, these, uh, inshallah ta'ala, today's session is a little bit more brief than the usual sessions. I'm going to be going over hopefully three ayat. And in these three ayat, Allah is presenting an overview of much of the discourse on the Israelites. You noticed in the previous passages, as I went through them, as I reached the conclusion of a passage, I'd give you a, a structural overview. Here's the subject matter, here's how it was covered, here's how it was organized. I haven't gotten a chance to do that with the, the passage on the Israelites yet, because we haven't reached its conclusion. You kind of have to get to ayah number 120, 121, before you can look back from, the, from 40 all the way to 121 and see the bigger picture, and see how it all comes together in, in beautiful, intricate fashion. In any case, today we begin, inshallah, with ayah number 87, where Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابِ And we certainly had given Musa alayhi salam the law. And so far, the only Prophet really extensively talked about is Musa alayhi salam. So he's coming back and offering us that gist. But then saying, وَقَفَّيْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ بِالرُّسُلِ 
and we reinforced and we created continuity thereafter, even after him. And you could say immediately after him, and you could also say for a long period after him with messengers. Now this is a very interesting use of uh, uh, language in the Quran, qaffayna. Qaffa, they say in Arabic, bima'na atba'a, to follow up. Meaning one messenger came, another came, another came, another came. There was this non-stop continuity of prophets and messengers for the Israelites. But the word qaffa or qafa in Arabic isn't just about following. It's actually about following in harmony. That's why lines of poetry are called qafia. Or pieces of poetry are called a qafia. Why? Because it synchronizes the number of syllables, how it flows, and it's got this rhythm to it. And it, it, it basically, it's like Lego pieces clicking together kind of thing, right? So it's not just that Allah sent prophets. It's the fact that these prophets were so synchronized in their message that they would literally mimic as far as their character and as far as the, the fundamental teachings they had to offer people, exactly the same thing. They weren't interested in teaching humanity some new, un previously undiscovered you know, uh, treasure that is now all of a sudden going to convince, convince them of the truth. The essential principles that Allah calls humanity to have always been the same. Nowhere is that more evident, in my opinion, than Surah Al-Shu'ara, Wallahu A'lam, the 26th Surah of the Qur'an. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُونَ Over and over again, you find the phrase, Be cautious of Allah and obey me. Be cautious of Allah and obey me. This, this is, now this interesting, the interesting thing about that is, that, that same phrase is used by Nuh alayhi salam, Salih alayhi salam, Shu'aib alayhi salam, it's used by Musa alayhi salam, it's used by several prophets across the ages, across cultures, across languages, that are centuries apart from each other and maybe regions and continents apart from each other in some cases and yet they're saying exactly the same thing that's the idea of taqfiya the idea of continuity without a break and this is actually one of the most powerful evidences used in the Quran when dealing and when, when calling the people of the book the Jewish and the Christian communities to the faith of Islam this is actually one of the fundamentals that's used for instance in the case of the Christians one of the core arguments that rests at the heart of many denominations of Christianity is Jesus is Lord and Savior. And He came, you know, He's the promised Son of God. And He is the greatest event that has ever happened in human history, His coming. And because, because of Him, the sins of humanity have been paid for and the path to salvation has been opened. You can tell I listen to a lot of sermons on Sundays. But anyway, I, I do my due diligence on this stuff. But anyway, so, so if that's the case, if this is such a big deal for all of humanity, isn't it noteworthy that every prophet that came before that Allah sent with revelation should have been telling people about the coming of the Son of God where all their, their, their sins will be forgiven and even before He comes you should believe in Him so your sins can be forgiven? This is, if this is such a big deal, then everyone before should have been foretelling His coming and telling it very explicitly and directly and the, the Christian will argue, well actually they did say things like the Comforter or the upright one, and there are you know, these kinds of predictions in the Torah, in the Old Testament, there are. But the upright one is not the same as the Son of God, like you're saying, nor is the Comforter, nor is any of the other, you know, uh, Paraklete, or any of, the, any of the variations that have been used in the Greek reference, in the Hebrew Bible, they don't ever refer to some partly divine creature that is going to come and save humanity. So we argue that what we're saying about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is actually consistent as far as a message is concerned with what every prophet of the Bible has already said. From, from Adam alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, what they're calling to as far as a faith in Allah is the same. It's the same God that's being called towards, right? So there's no lack of, you know, you know there's no, no synchronization that needs to be done artificially, that we need to tally up what they said and what, what, what these ones said and match it together, no. And actually part of the role of the Qur'an is to remove those distortions, those unfortunate lies that were deliberately and sometimes just because of the lack of care over time in history added in to the text of the Bible. The things that were said about prophets that should never have been said. The things that were said about their message that should never have been said. And in summary, Allah is saying those prophets are not to blame. That's the people who transcribed their message, يُحَرِّفُونَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا عَقَلُوهُ They edited it after even having understood it. And in one word, he absolves the prophets from deviating from the central message. Like they all stayed on point. Now what's that one word? قَفَّيْنَا وَقَفَّيْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ بِالرُّسُلِ 
we, we, we continued them in sync with each other, one after the other, with messengers. Now, the other important thing in this ayah so far is the use of the word ar-rusul, which is translated messengers. And there, of course, in Islamic studies, there's a long debate about the difference between prophets, nabi, anbiya, and messengers, ar-rusul. And some people have argued there's no difference between them. Some people have argued there's a massive difference between them. Some have argued all of them are prophets because messenger is basically a special role given to a prophet. So when a messenger has a more important responsibility above and beyond receiving revelation, the, or the, the other way around, when a, when a prophet has higher responsibility, he becomes a messenger. So Nabi and Rasul. Nabi comes from the word Naba, which means news. Anyone who receives news of the unseen, receives revelation, is a Nabi. But a Rasul is a little bit different. It comes from the word Risala. And Risala means a message. And Rasul, another term for Rasul in the Quran is also Al Mursaleen, the ones that were sent. Which is a little bit, it's a different variation. It's in, you know, it's the uh, uh, Ism Maf'ul. It's the passive participle as opposed to the active participle, the ism maf'ul, which means the ones that are sent. Now that's a little bit different, so let me com compare that for a little bit for you. You have people like Ya'qub alayhi salam, who if you study the Qur'an is not preaching to a nation and warning them that destruction is coming, and if they don't listen to his message, then there are going to be consequences, nor is he showing them miracles, etc, etc, etc. When you study Ya'qub alayhi salam, you're learning about a man who tried to raise good children. And he, he received revelation, and he was inspired by the fact that his young son, Yusuf السلام, also seems to have the gift Allah has given him that he's going to be re receiving revelation also, right? Hello? Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> what was I saying? Something about Islam? Yusuf al yes, yes. Okay. Yusuf السلام, he's not, I mean, he worked under a king, right? That's what we learned. Fi deen al malik, he worked under the constitution of a king. But unlike Musa, who's preaching to the Pharaoh, Yusuf السلام, is actually part of the government and helping out. And there's no mention of him trying to convert. Though later on, there is a reference to it, a passing reference to it in Surah Ghafir. That when Yusuf السلام, died, that actually the, the Pharaohs, they even said, لَمْ يَبْعَثَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ رَسُولًا Allah will not be appointing another messenger again. So we think of him as a Nabi all the time, but after his passing, it seems, we learn you know, from an indirect reference mentioned by the Egyptians themselves, that you people were the ones who said, Allah won't be sending another one, appointing another messenger again. In other words, he did have a message. When he was in a position of prominence, he decided to deliver the message. So he wasn't just a, you know, a passive, receive the revelation for himself kind of a, a prophet. Now, the difference between them seems to be very clear in the Qur'an in some respects. It's not so clear in other respects, it is very clear in some respects. I'll highlight a couple of quick ones. Messengers seem to be people that are on a mission, on a very particular mission to deliver a very particular message to a deformed nation, to a nation that is falling apart. And their job is to actually set the course straight for that nation. And it's also happened that messengers were, were viciously opposed. They were viciously opposed. And it even came to a point where people tried to kill messengers. But they always failed. Nobody was ever able to, try to, uh, able to kill a messenger. And Allah alludes to that reality in the Quran also when He says, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَا أَغْلِبَنَّا أَنَا وَرُسُلِي Allah has mandated, Allah has decreed, I will certainly overcome I and my messengers. And that clearly is a reference to what happens in this world, not in the next. Because in the next world, it is not just Allah's messengers that overcome, it's actually all believers that overcome. And secondly, the idea of ghalaba, the idea of dominance, doesn't fit the afterlife. The afterlife is more about falah, of success. But the idea of overcoming and overpowering and being dominant is a, is a worldly concept. And so when Allah says He's dictated that He and His messengers shall overcome, that it doesn't fit the picture of the afterlife, but rather of this one. In other words, messengers, yes, people tried to overcome them, but the people that did, Allah overcame them. Like in the case of Nuh salam, those words are so poetic and so beautiful. You know, وَحَمَلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ تَجْرِي بِأَعْيُنِنَا جَزَاءً لِمَنْ كَانَ كُفِرٍ So amazing. He says, we boarded him on. Now you all know he was boarded onto the ark. But Allah doesn't call it the ark. 
He, does, he could have called it al-fulk, and that would have been the ark, and it's done. And it's actually, the, the word fulk on a tangent is literally an ark-shaped vessel. Falak is actually an orbit that's oval-shaped. Something that's not quite a circle is called a falak or a fulk. So anyway, he doesn't say, you know, that he boarded him onto al-fulk only. He says, ala dati al-wahid wa dusur. We boarded him on something made up of just planks and nails. Like he literally just calls it a bunch of planks and nails. And why, why would he say that? He says that because at the end of the day, this ship wasn't meant to survive the kind of catastrophe that was going to hit humanity. It is only these planks and nails had no power to save anyone except if Allah didn't will. And literally in the language Allah is describing how Nuh goes after every single plank and every single nail. ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُورٍ تَجْرِبِ أَعْيُنِنَا that, sh- that sails away under our watch. That floats under our watch. جَزَاءً لِمَنْ كَانَ كُفِرٍ That's a compensation for someone who was disbelieved in. In other words, Allah is talking about Nuh السلام, that he was disbelieved in as a messenger. So he, he gets to be rescued. He gets to be dominant, literally. And everybody else is underneath. فَهُوَ الَّذِي غَلَبْ وَهَؤُلَاءَ الَّذِي غَرَقُوا you know, they were, they were the ones who drowned. So now, when, so messengers are people that aren't dominated in the worldly sense. If you compare this to Anbiya, the Quran actually says in this surah and in the next surah and other places also, يَقْتُلُونَ النَّبِيِّينَ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ يَقْتُلُونَ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ They killed prophets without any justification or without the right to do so. So the idea is now that prophets were in fact overcome in this life. So there does seem to be a difference. For those who argue there's absolutely no difference, I offer yet another bit of, you know, small insight from the Qur'an. مِن نَبِيٍ وَلَا رَسُولٍ Qur'an will use the phrase Nabi and Rasul together in the same ayah. Neither Prophet nor Messenger. That's the snippet I'm sharing with you. Neither Prophet nor Messenger. Or neither Messenger nor Prophet. When Allah does that, the principle of Arabic rhetoric is, is, is When two things come together, synonyms, come together, the point is that they're not the same. The point is to highlight that they're actually different from each other. If you call somebody a Muslim, or you call somebody a Mu'min, it's fine. But if you say neither a Muslim nor a Mu'min, then you're highlighting that there is in fact the difference between Muslim and Mu'min. So the same way when you put Prophet and Messenger in the same ayah, then intent, by intent, purposefully, Allah is distinguishing these two entities. Now in this ayah, Allah is saying, He is not the only Messenger sent. We've, we reinforced him with other messengers as well, which means they carried a unique, distinct message. Now, how, how are we to understand that the Torah is the actual message, and that was given to who? Who was Torah given to? Musa alayhi salam. So all the others should have been simply just prophets, not a unique message of their own, but actually as you learn in history, the entire Torah was obliterated. It was completely destroyed. There was not a piece of it left. And Allah sent messengers to rewrite, to re-restore, like Uzair alayhi salam, Ezra they call him in the Bible, to rewrite the Torah again. Now he's a messenger of Torah again. And then the Torah was so altered, that by the time Jesus comes, Isa alayhi salam comes, that he actually, Allah didn't just reveal the gospel to him, al-Injil. Quran says, يُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَالتَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Allah will teach him the book, the law, the wisdom, the Torah, and the Injil. In other words, Isa alayhi salam is a scholar of the Torah from Revelation. He didn't have to learn from the rabbis to learn the Torah. He learned the original and he could literally hear them recite the Torah and tell them there's a word you changed, there's a word you changed, there's a law you changed. The actual ayah is like this. That's why they hated his guts, like they really hated him. And can you imagine a messenger who knows the book of Allah, the Torah, and he listens to people who claim to be scholars, recite that same book in a distorted and corrupted fashion, how offended he would be by them. And if you understand that context, you'll appreciate how, how like not, no holds barred Jesus was when it came to the rabbis. Like he was really offensive. He'd call them all kinds of names that the Quran is spared, and I've made reference to that before. But notice now, the chain began with Musa. وَآتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابِ وَقَفَّيْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ بِالرُّسُلِ Okay, lots of messengers came. Fine. وَآتَيْنَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ And we gave Isa, the son of Maryam, clear, miraculous signs. And we aided him with Ruh al-Qudus, the spirit of the, the Holy, which the Bible calls the Holy Spirit, basically, right? And this is a reference to Gabriel, to Jibreel alayhi salam. Now, this is interesting on a few accounts. 
Isa alayhi salam is the only messenger in the Quran that is mentioned with his mom. As a matter of fact, he's the only one mentioned with his parent. You don't find Muhammad ibn Abdullah. You, you, don't, you don't find that. You don't find Salih ibn, Musa ibn. You don't find that. But when it comes to Isa, to Jesus, he says ibn Maryam. Over and over again. Isa ibn Maryam. Why? And the other thing is for the Arab ear, for the Semitic ear also. When they heard ibn, the next word they want to hear is the name of a man. But they hear Isa ibn Maryam. This is shocker. So you don't say that. You actually are supposed to reference the father. And that's why even the entire name of a nation, it was given by the father's name. To this day, in majority societies in the world, your identity is determined by the name you would adopt from who? From your father. So that's why the Israelites are called Banu Israel, Binai Israel, children of Israel, children of the father, right? Israel. Where humanity, one of the names of humanity is not children of Hawa. We call ourselves children of Adam. Even she's our mom, but that's the that's the dominant usage in culture across the, across majority societies in the world. Your identity comes from your father. But Allah goes out of His way to say Isa ibn Maryam, and in this case, wa ataina Isa ibn Maryam, to highlight a couple of things. One, because when she gave birth to Jesus, when she gave birth to Isa alayhi salam, she was accused of having an illegitimate child. And that's the worst accusation you can make against a dignified woman, especially a believing woman. You know, that's the worst slanderous thing you can possibly say. And Allah decided that until the day of judgment, the final revelation will be recited. And every time you honor this messenger, you'll have to honor his mother. Like those who tried to humiliate her, failed in such a way that even in this final revelation, every time we pronounce his name, subhanAllah, we say Ibn Maryam. Ibn Maryam, the, the son of Maryam, subhanAllah, it's incredible. Then other, there's, there's another interesting side note, since Adam alayhi salam has come up, and Isa alayhi salam has come up, right? Really, really interesting. There's peculiar qualities of the Qur'an that sometimes just leave me baffled. Allah will say in Surah Ali Imran, He's going to say, إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَى عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابْ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ he says the example of Jesus, as far as God is concerned, is the, is the like, likeness of Adam. So to him, Adam السلام, and Isa السلام, are not that different. There's a commonality to them. And he adds, he didn't just say, Adam is like Jesus. He added, Indallahi, as far as Allah is concerned, or with Allah, they're the same. Now, that's an interesting phrase. It occurs, which surah did I say it occurs again? Okay, this is the seventh time that this that, that Adam alayhi salam's name is mentioned. If you study Quran from the beginning, when that ayah comes up, Adam is mentioned and Isa is mentioned. It's the seventh time Adam is mentioned and it's the seventh time Isa is mentioned, in order. And if you go past it, Adam is going to be mentioned another 18 times. And Isa is also going to be mentioned another 18 times in an oral tradition Exactly the number of times Adam is mentioned is the number of times Isa is mentioned alayhi salam. And Allah Himself says, the example of Isa, as far as Allah is concerned, is just like the example of Adam, even in frequency, even though they're not next to each other. It's mind-boggling how Allah does that. SubhanAllah. And even that, by the time that statement comes, the number of mentions before and the number of mentions after are exactly the same. Six before and three times that after. SubhanAllah. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious even about the three times. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get to that later. We gave Isa, the son of Maryam, all kinds of miracles. We gave, them, we gave him the, the, the purest of miracles, self-evident truths you can call al bayinat also. This is where it gets interesting. We aided him القدس, with the Holy Spirit. And the thing is, we know in Islam that the angel that brings revelation is actually Ruh al-Qudus. Which means he's the same Ruh al-Qudus who helped Musa. He's the same Ruh al-Qudus who helped Dawud alayhi salam, who aided Uzayr alayhi salam. It's the same Ruh al-Qudus that helped Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. It's the same messenger with that same job of delivering revelation. That's what he does. But why specifically highlight him with Isa? Some have looked at the biblical subtext behind this and illustrated that this is actually Allah coming to not only dignify Maryam, because 
they did a few things, right? They tried to dishonor Isa alayhi salam by calling him an Ill illegitimate child. Of course, by doing so, they're also trying to dishonor Maryam. But later on in life, when they were constantly being questioned about the alterations of the Torah, they started insulting Jibreel alayhi salam. And so I'll show you something that happens. I'll read something off from the Bible to you. Then he went home, and the crowd came together again. This is referring to Jesus. And so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. So there were people that wouldn't, they got so sick they couldn't even eat. Some became mute, some became blind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, by, and by the ruler of the demons, he has cast them out. In other words, Isa alayhi salam cured people, and Quran makes reference to this, he cured people, and the rabbis said, he actually calls on the giant demon, Beelzebul, he calls on him, and gets that jinn to kick out these other jinn. So he's, he's just calling on jinns, he's just a devil worshipper calling on jinns. That he doesn't get help from Jibreel alayhi salam or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gets help from the jinns. And later on, you find in the same passage, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins. These are the words of Jesus in the Bible. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. And, and for that they say, he has an unclean spirit. And by the way, the idea of being unclean, wasikh, right, dirty or unclean, the opposite of it, the extreme opposite of it is actually qudus. Holy, pure, clean. Allah calls him, وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ Qudus. We aided him with the pure spirit. In other words, when somebody says, Rasul, uh, the Isa alayhi receives help from a dirty spirit, Allah says, no, that's a clean spirit. Right? So it's actually contrasting their violation against Isa alayhi salam. In doing so, the Qur'an has done something very important. It's actually pinpointed a problem of the Jewish community as they live in Medina. They're being told, this is not the first messenger you've done a crime against. You're, de you're denying the message given by Jibreel alayhi salam the second time. You already did this with Isa. وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ أَفَكُلَّمَا جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِمَا لَا تَهْوَىٰ أَنفُسُكُمْ Every time a messenger came to you with something your inner selves didn't like, istakbartum, you became arrogant. Fafariqan kadabtum wa fariqan taqtulun. Then a group among you, the a group you just call liars. You just demonize them and you basically delegitimize them and call them liars, and another group you killed. Wa fariqan taqtulun. Now what is this a reference to? It's actually a reference to the rabbis that are now being directly challenged for what they say on behalf of the Torah. Listen to this part carefully. The rabbis were now the authority that speaks on behalf of God's law, the Torah, the, the book of God. And when they speak on behalf of it, sometimes they said they passed rulings that just don't have any evidence in the book. They just pass these rulings that don't have a standing. And the common masses of people don't have knowledge of the book to challenge them. They don't have the wherewithal to be able to question that your, this ruling that you created is not based, actually even contradicts revelation. How can you pass this ruling? Nobody can challenge them. On top of that, they created a culture with the, with, where the rabbis were actually holier and closer to God than everybody else. So questioning them feels almost blasphemous. It's like you're questioning Allah Himself. To give you a, par a parallel, if you, for example, are a revering Muslim, come to the masjid every day, and you have an imam you have a lot of respect for, and one day your imam just says something crazy. Like he just says something really out there. And the thought comes to you, maybe I should go to him and ask. I don't know if that sounds right, imam. I don't think that's correct. The more qualified the imam is, the more hesitant you will be to say something. The more, the more intimidating he looks, the more the, the holier he looks, the more, I don't know, his beard is way too big, I don't think I can. Because if it was like this much, I would have been okay, but it's this much, so which means he can't be wrong. Yeah, you know. And he's got the Superman thingy on top, so like that's like, we, we can't, like this, he's practically floating in the air, so I can't really question him. And then when someone does, somebody comes along and says, look, I, I'm not a scholar, but what you're saying seems to contradict this ayah. Or I don't understand how that can go in line with this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Or how can you say this when the incident that happened in his life was like this? And I see a clear contradiction here. Maybe I'm not understanding it, maybe you can help me understand. If you simply even in a civil way, in a respectful way, raise that question. What happens to you? Well, two things happen. 
فَرِيقًا كَذَّبْتُمْ وَفَرِيقًا تَقْتُلُونَ That's the ayah's conclusion. Every time they brought, he, he brought you something that your own selves didn't like. Now put it in context. Who's bringing what? Isa was bringing original Torah to the rabbis of the Torah. And he's saying that's what Torah says. And they say, who are you to tell me? Where did you get your ijazah from? I studied under rabbi so and so and so. I have this many ijazat. I have this many certifications. I am a you know, qualified alim. And you're going to challenge me? How old are you anyway? When did you learn Torah? Well, when he was a baby. So this is not child's play. Well, it's not play, but it is certainly for this child. Isa alayhi salam. He can question you. And when he did, they got really offended. Who does he think he is? How dare he ask these questions? And that's what Allah calls istakbartum. You became arrogant. You became arrogant. This statement, arrogance, is actually here pointed at a corrupt breed of scholarship that cannot stand being questioned or told there's a contradiction in what they're saying. That it doesn't represent Allah's book. That there's a problem. They are closing what Allah opened or opening what Allah closed. You, you can't restrict what Allah meant to keep open. And you can't open what Allah meant to restrict. You can't do it. And you will be challenged. But they, it actually hits them personally. It's not a matter of let's get to the bottom of what Allah wants. Me being questioned after my lecture, somebody comes and says, I disagree with what you said here, here, and here. My attitude is supposed to be, here's why I thought it's correct. Here are my evidences. What do you think? Why do you think this is incorrect? What are your evidences? Because sincerely, I want to know how close you and I can get to the truth. Our loyalty is not to our opinion, or to our self-esteem, or to our reputation. Our loyalty is to the truth. And so if there is truth, and somebody brings up something, somebody says, what about this ayah? And I say, I didn't think about that before. Or I didn't even realize. I'm supposed to change my position. I'm supposed to say, you're right. Or if I know something better, I'll say, well, actually,